no acronym this week. We're just going to get right into it. It's snowing outside, but we're cozied up by the virtual fireplace. And we're going to, in the immortal words of Grumpy G-san, talk some anime. You ready? I'm always ready. Okay. Well, since you're so gung-ho, why don't you choose which show we start with? But you're hosting. <laughs> it's supposed to be your job. Okay. Um, I'm Honestly, all five of the, the winter anime that we're watching and, and doing week by week, I think all of them had a pretty lousy sixth episode. Really? Um, I mean, m- maybe maybe not. Maybe they weren't all lousy, but but none of them were the, the highlight of the show so far. I, I could disagree me. with that. Okay. Um, I, I think... Uh, I could and I do more definitively. I mean, if, I, if we just start with the one that I think had the best episode, then it'll be obvious which one I, you know, which one I think is the best. And then when we, when we rank all five right. at the end of the podcast, there, won't, there won't be any suspense. No surprises. Oh, no. So we'll just, we'll just. All right. Randomly, let's start with Sorayori then. Okay. Oh, before we do that, just a reminder for everybody who's listening and wanting us to get on with it and talk about their favorite show. Just look at the timestamps in the description box. Just look down there. You can click straight to, you know, the the discussion of the show that you care about and skip all the other bullshit. So let's do a place farther than the universe or further. I guess it's spelled officially. Officially. They're in Sydney now. The girls have, they got on a plane and they, they flew to Sydney. I'm pretty sure that's where they are in Australia. Well, you see, I think you see the opera house, the Sydney uh, opera house. Do you? Yeah. At one point. I don't know. I could be totally wrong. I'm not really familiar with, Australia. Any I'm not familiar with any place that isn't it's hard where to be we fr- live. It's hard to be familiar with it because it's all upside down. That's true. It's on the it's on the wrong side of the equator. It's uh it's it's just wrong in general. Yep. The land down under. Under where? Underwater. Is it? I mean part of it probably. Yeah. There are there are a bunch of uh, you know what, this this isn't anime related. They're they're in Sydney or someplace in Australia. Although we don't hear we don't hear a single word of English dialogue, other than the exchange at the at the uh, the ticket counter at the very end, which is like the same phrase repeated twice. But it's, uh, Shira says like she's trying to change the tickets, and the the attendant just says no. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> no. That's the only dialogue you hear from uh you know a non girl character like well, it, one it, of. The, Someone apart from the four main characters. It would be very difficult for a Japanese person to do Australian English. Yeah, that's probably true. They're very difficult for t- for any other dialogue of English to understand. Hmm. Yeah, I, I hadn't thought about that. And it's it's always dicey whenever anime tries to do an English accent. So I guess it would be like way, way harder. You think they just Australian hire an American or no, they, an, oh, no, a native English that. speaker? You can't hire a gaijin to work on anime. The results would be disastrous. Really? No, I mean, white people, foreigners, Americans, of, and people from all other types of countries, I assume, have worked on anime. I can, I can think of a couple off the top of my head. Michael DeWitt, he did The Red Turtle in association with Ghibli. That was like two years ago. And uh, the guy who did Tech on Kingcrete, whose name I forget. Anyway, none of this has to do with a place farther than the universe. So let's start talking about that show right now. Okay. And we'll link to this part in the timestamp. So they're in Sydney, Australia. (laughs) We're we're pretty sure. And the big, uh, I mean, the focal event of this episode is that Hinata loses her passport. Right. Which, by the end of the episode, we learned she didn't lose it. Shirase was holding it the whole time. Shirase lost it. Yeah. Well, (laughs) she didn't lose it. She had it. No, she. But if she you're not, missed, if you're not able to find something, to me that means you've lost it. Okay, I, I guess I can see that. I mean, what other definition would misplaced. there be? Misplaced. Okay. Yeah, she misplaced her passport. They both did, and it almost cost them a million yen. And the way that she slams days. the yen down on the counter, <laughs> just without it's like, thinking about how much it is or how much the the extra ticket's going to cost. Right. What a badass. It just reminded me of those fateful plays of the last piece of Exodia 
in the original oh, season of Yu-Gi-Oh. Yeah, when you slam something down on a, on a flat surface. And you get those black lines and it's... The speed lines? Yeah, and it I goes from the perspective of the money to the person that's looking at it. Yeah. Classic anime. Yep, I guess so. <laughs> She was she was just so emotional because uh, I don't know she wanted she and Hinata, Hinata to be bonded. able to go. Yeah, yeah. The, the the episode starts with some amount of not if not necessarily foreshadowing, but showing you know a piece of of her past, a piece of what uh, Hinata being her used to used to have or was missing. It starts with that. Yeah, because they're in they're in the airport, and she sees that team, the people with the blue jackets with the the red stripe on them. Yeah, which we learn later to be a team she had been a part of. She stares, she's she looks at them, sees them, kind of stares at them, and trips off the moving walkway because of it. Right, I remember that. Yeah, they they did have the same jerseys or or uh, or track suits or whatever those were. Right, as people from her high school, I think they were the same. So did she used to run track? I guess. Or play some kind of sport or she was in some kind of club. Yeah. And then they, all the other members of the club, what, did they freeze her out or what? It, the way she explains it or the way she, you know, talks about this situation is that she doesn't want people to have to adapt or change to her, you know, to, uh, like they have to force themselves. To be considerate of her. Yeah, That's what she To be considerate hates. of her, Yeah. So something like that had been going on in the team or whatever. They don't they don't exactly elaborate on that. They'd just be like, yeah, I used to be part of a group, but I couldn't hang with them anymore. Now so I'm a I left wolf. <laughs> and I work at a convenience store. And according to um what's the what's the girl's name? Which one? The main girl with the bangs. Shoot, I'm forgetting her name. Uh, Isn't it like Mari? Uh, I don't think I wrote it down for this episode. I think I think it's Mari. Wait, I can find out for sure if I just scroll over here. Scroll. Anyway, over. the the girl. Remember, she she comes up with like a, a hypothetical scenario about what Hinata will do if she's stuck in Australia, and she'll and be she's a still, cashier. Yeah, still, she's still working at a convenience store. Yeah, and talking in like broken Japanese about how oh she used to be from Glorious Nippon. What is that? It's I'm pretty sure it's Mary. Mari, yeah, I guess it would be Mari. Sorry for any people who are obsessed by the fact that we can't. I mean, upset. Upset by the fact that we can't properly pronunciate. Pro- <laughs> pronunciate. You just, you just better, you better cut this sentence off before it gets. Too I should bad. just stop talking before it gets to you know bush levels of silliness. <laughs> I did say pronunciate. Okay. Um, I like the, the fish. There wasn't to me. There wasn't a lot to this episode. Um, they they spent about half of it just seeing the sights in Australia. Well, first seeing the sights at the the airport in Japan. None of them had been on um, a flight except for what's her face, right? Uh, uh, Insta girl. Yeah, the model, like the idol, whatever her her name is. Yeah, she's the she's the one whose name I can't really remember. I don't either. I remember it starts with a Y, I think. Yaomi, yo, <laughs> yo, let's call her yo. Why is it so hard to remember Japanese names? I don't know. Anyway, they she's the only one who's been on a plane. The others are all you know starstruck. They're just they're just taken aback at every little thing. They're buying souvenirs once they get to Australia, and it's wearing on the the idol girl's patience. <laughs> And Probably because the first couple times uh, she visited anywhere with her mom, her mom did the same thing. Uh, I don't know. I think it might have been her doing that and her, her mom being exasperated. So now she's like a mom. Now the shoe's these. on the other foot. Yeah, now she's the experienced traveler and all the other girls are freaking out about like airplanes and mm-hmm. elaborating on dreams about how they had always wanted to be an airplane. Not not a pilot. <laughs> An airplane. An airplane. Specifically. Yeah. Maybe they uh, maybe they saw JJ the jet plane when they were kids. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> a Japanese dubbed version of JJ the jet plane. Ooh. So the main uh yeah, the big thing that happens in this episode. Uh Hinata loses her passport. It was in Shirase's bag all along. 
which we don't find out until the end. And you got you've got like the the music from it's like some horror music, yeah. just overlaid as yeah. she as she realizes that she's holding the passport and then just tries not to play to, it play it off as nothing. Yeah. Like ah, uh, nothing's wrong. So I I don't I don't know. This episode was really was really light for me. It wasn't one of my favorites. The whole conflict question mark between Hinata and Shirase. You know, Shirase wants to be considerate of others despite her obsession with Antarctica and Hinata doesn't want to be a burden on other people. She doesn't want to feel that way. Right. Because she's felt that way previously in her life. And she she doesn't like it. Based on whatever experiences she's had with other people, people. who she's who she's known before. And that's and it gets resolved pretty quickly and there's a lot of there's a lot like a lot of speechifying. Um I just when I when I saw when I was watching any of their their conversations or their their arguments back and forth, I was I flashed back to the scene with um Idol Girl when she you know, when she's like sitting alone on her bed and she's like quietly processing the fact that she's being rejected again by people who she wants to be friends with. And that was all it was all silent. You know? Show, don't tell. I guess, but you don't even need to trot out that phrase just to I mean one one scene makes me feel like really bad for a character and makes me connect with them and the other is like it's it says that they could have just put the script on the screen and I could have just read it that's that's how I felt I, I wasn't too into this episode how about you um I mean I still liked the episode I don't think I would consider it bad by by any stretch of the imagination not specifically because there's worse, but I do like these sort of episodes that, well, they obviously have to manufacture a conflict in order to try to get the characters to grow towards each other. Because, you know, as they stated in a previous episode, they don't really know each other. Yeah. They've only been friends for, what, a month, a little bit, and now they're off to one of the most dangerous places in the entire world. So they you know, are obviously going to butt heads because they don't know each other they don't you know have every in and out as to you know what's your personality like you know how do we get along how do we not hate each other for three months when we're gonna be trapped in a freezing metal box freezing metal box the the living conditions in antarctica are not kind sure it's it's freezing but yeah it's what, cold. what's the deal with the metal box are they gonna be no a lot of the a lot of the structures are just super basic metal storage buildings they're didn't not they didn't they go nice. to some museum and see um like an example of the living quarters that they're they're going to be in there was you know there was a bunk bed and there were yeah. a bunch of it was a museum so there were like planes around yep i don't remember it i mean the, the, the exterior of the building is super basic it looks like a metal box okay that's what i meant by that i think i remember seeing a trailer or something like that um when Whenever Shirase is talking about how the fact that her mom was in Antarctica, sometimes the they'll cut to you know a, a picture of like an orange and gray kind of trailer looking thing. Yep, I guess that's metal. I do, I just don't have that exact image in my in my head of the metal box. I guess. Okay. Well, yeah, they're gonna they're gonna be trapped together in a in a place that's really difficult. To they learn. gotta hash all this stuff out before they get there. Or they're yeah. gonna kill each other. Yeah, that's that's true. The show is it only has a a number of episodes to work with before they're thrown into Antarctica. And I, I did, go ahead. You you say that it was pretty much the same as just reading a script, but I disagree because that kind of does a bit of a disservice to the voice actors. Because, yeah, it does. <laughs> Cuz they have to, you know, they're they're putting a lot of themselves into these roles and these characters and that that's what allows you to connect with anybody the you know the words they're speaking are important but how it's portrayed is is really what i enjoy listening to because i've listened to you know bad dubs and you know terribly done television shows before and listening to conversational dialogue between two characters that don't exist but almost re almost relating to them and feeling like they're human or personified really well is uh, I really like it I enjoy it 
yeah, voice acting is important, and I I'm definitely writing it off when I when I say that you could have just put the the script on the screen. Yeah, the, the reason I say that is because I I just didn't I didn't like how talky this conflict was, and if you lose your passport, if you lose your passport, excuse me. There has to be there has to be a lot of conversation surrounding that because there has to be strategizing about well what are we going to do how are we going to get to Antarctica on time can we afford to be late will they still let us get on the boat yada 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 um, it's it's just the the like after Hinata gets the shower and and she she comes out and they have that conversation about not wanting to be um, a, a burden or not wanting other people to be considerate of her they. Just in in the course of her expressing that to Shira say she used the same phrases over and over and I was just I was just bothered by that like I'm I'm looking for I'm looking for realism and sure that's that's how the conversation might go in real life it wasn't it wasn't like sloppily written or anything it wasn't unbelievable but it wasn't uh, it didn't make me feel any closer to either of those characters okay. But it wasn't, uh, you know, that's just, that was my personal feeling about this episode. I don't think that the conversation was bad or that the episode was bad. It, was, it might be my least favorite episode of the show so far. Although I don't have a perfect memory, you know, this is, we've, we're six episodes in, so. Understandable. You want to do a different one? Yeah, I'd say so. Let's try to stay more on topic for this next one. Yeah. Because <laughs> instead of talking about whatever we talked about when we started, uh, like, however many minutes ago. Um, what do you want to do? Evergarden? Sure, why not? I didn't like this episode very much. <laughs> you didn't like that memory doll flow? Nope. Yeah, well, they, I, that's that's speaking of auto memory dolls. Up until this point, we've only seen them being used for uh letters, you know, writing taking people's thoughts that they express out loud and and putting them on the page, you know, right. typing them up. And, you know, giving it that Thrill or yeah. that that pizzazz that uh that auto memory doll spice. If so many people are incapable of writing, how could it, has everyone have the ability to read? Not everyone has the ability to read. So then, if you're trying to send these letters to people, isn't it a possibility that they get this beautifully crafted letter and they can't read? They're just like, can you explain what this they, is? They might get uh somebody to read it for them. Do you remember the scene from the previous episode? I guess with the with the prince and the princess, uh, there were a bunch of scenes of not only the letters being posted for people, but to someone read. was standing there and reading it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just think it would be so funny if you you spent you saved your money, you spent a bunch of it, and you got someone to write this beautiful letter to this girl <laughs> that you love, and she can't read it. Well, if you're if you're close enough to someone that you're willing to spend money to send them a letter, if you're that familiar with, I that guess you probably know if they could read. Yeah, you, you're probably <laughs> aware of whether they're literate or not. But enough about the previous episode. This one, it so it wasn't there was no letter writing. Instead, it was just transcription that 80 different dolls were doing at right. uh, an observatory in some new country. I can't remember the name of it. I wrote it, uh, and it's on the screen to my left, but I don't want to turn my head. Some so. Kilimanjaro-type place. Okay. Mountain, well, that, snow. Yeah, that was the observatory. That's where it was located, yeah. up high. Because you, be, you need to be at a certain elevation to see the stars properly, I guess. And... So the, the like the main focus of this episode was not Violet, it was Leon, the the astrologist with whom she's paired. Yeah. And I didn't really care very much about him. Like his big thing was that he he hates women or that he's he's cold to them. No, he he or, hates love. I think it is. No, remember when he's explaining to Violet how he's he's always cold to women and he doesn't understand why? No, he says he's bad with women. Oh, we watched... If, I'm watching uh, the Vivid Essenti version. Yeah, you probably I'm, got it from Horrible Subs. I got it from Horrible Subs. Yeah. He I, says, he says that he's bad with women. Like, I don't know how to talk to them. I end up coming across as cold and unfeeling uh, and I'm not trying to. That's, that's what they say in the Horrible Subs version? Basically, yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, subtitles really are important, I guess, because they well, color your entire impression of characters and they stories. They don't color your impression of it. They, yes, they, they define it. Yeah. Because you have be no way other way to, to infer anything about this character other than what he looks like. A slightly effeminate man. Uh, I don't think he's meant to be effeminate. I think that he's just a Kyoto animation character, 
And so that's how he looks. No, but there are other men that are like, you know, big and manly and strong with like well, that he has, super V chin. He has long hair. Yeah, so that, I, that's that's what I mean. If you think basically. having long hair makes you effeminate, then you probably need a haircut because I'm looking at you right now. That's true. My hair is quite long. <laughs> um, yeah, so in my subs, they said that he's cold to women. And I think I think that makes more sense, honestly, because remember that his backstory is his mother abandoned him to look for her her husband and his father. Okay. So he was he was abandoned by the most important woman in his life at that point, his mother. So you would think that that would probably generate some resentment towards women. And that I think that's what he has. Like he remember at the very beginning he he claims that all the only reason that a woman would be in auto memory dolls because they're looking for a rich husband. Yeah, that that part came through as well, but the end scene where they're talking together, it was apparently completely different. Well, the the end scene where they're talking together is the one where she's leaving on the that uh, no, when they're on the, when they're on the roof. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, that's when they're talking, and he's like, "I don't know how to talk to women and stuff like that." I I mean, I trust uh, fan sub groups more than I trust Crunchyroll subs, which are horrible subs. So that's I'm going with. Okay, I mean, I I'm I'm not. Don't I'm you think not it makes? That. Don't you think that makes sense based on like the snide comment he made at the start about them wanting to marry into money, and his backstory, his mom abandoning him. Well, maybe that would be just for professional women, but maybe not all women. Yes, all women. All Hashtag women. <laughs> Hashtag all women are dolls. Uh, so he he was the main focus of the episode. We're getting a little bit off track, kind of. Yeah. He's the main focus. It's not Violet, really. And he, you know, of course, he meets Violet. She's She's really beautiful. He falls in love with her. Yep and breaking hearts yeah she breaking doesn't hearts and cracking skulls <laughs> she, t- <laughs> she took the job because she didn't understand what love was and now like you know everywhere she goes everyone's like oh kide look at that beautiful doll person i love her <laughs> <laughs> she yeah, is she's... she is the personification of love um, maybe that's what we're supposed to infer really <laughs> Maybe that's the whole theme. No, the theme is she doesn't understand emotions and she has to get to get to know people and yeah. understand how What really make perplexed them feel. me about this episode is that it completely snubbed the ending yeah, of okay. episode yes. five. Why is okay. Yeah. Like nev- <laughs> not didn't reference it, not even a frame was devoted to what happened. Yeah, I wonder if that's a result of Netflix meddling. Like sometimes um, networks, studios, whatever. Out of order? Yeah, maybe? they air episodes out of order on purpose. So we got a firefly think, on our hands. They think they know better than the people making the show. They think because they're funding it that, you know, that gives them the right and that gives them the... It means their idea is perfect, whatever it is. So, if yep. it, I, I mean, I, I shouldn't go off too hard about that because I don't know if that was the case. Maybe Kyoto Animation just... effed up. Yeah, that's possible. Or maybe episode six wasn't done in time, so they had to out of order it. Uh, no, I don't think that's the case because I, I, I doubt it as well. But it's Net, a possibility. Netflix likes to have the whole show in the can before it uploads it because it it's even though it's not airing on um, U.S. Netflix, even though it's not up there, it is in a whole bunch of other countries besides Japan, and it's already dubbed in a bunch of different languages. From what I understand. So I think the whole show's finished. So they I, are, are they releasing it like week by week? Yeah. On Netflix in Japan? Y- um, yes. Wow, that is really unlike them. Well, it's, I think it's standard because that's how things are done in Japan. I guess. And so when the whole thing's done, it'll probably come to us with a dub. Yeah, probably so. That's, that's my guess. Anyway, yeah, they they disregarded because the the scene at the end of episode five was there was a, a captain or something from the the enemy, yeah, the people who she had fought against, and he says, "Oh, you you know you killed a bunch of my men," and they have like that big stare off at the end of the port, and then nothing in this episode. Ta-da! Yeah, I can only assume that something went wrong. Episodes were aired out of order. They just literally forgot what they had animated and recorded. <laughs> Yo, could anybody find episode five storyboard? No? Okay, start over. 
who know who knows what happened there i assume that we'll circle back around to it at some point i mean the the war is like the biggest event that happened in this in this fictional universe so and we don't even see any of it well yes we do we saw a flashback yeah, to violet's fighting days we've heard a whole much. bunch about the major uh we know about this guy now we know that uh luculia's brother and we saw luculia or lucalia i don't know Again, in this episode uh, <laughs> we should just call her lucario from now on and uh the episode five it was it was all about the tensions between two two right, states the two uh states that were fighting yeah so what the what all the dolls do in in this episode is they they copy a bunch of old astrological texts and they they part they get partnered up with the different guys working and living at the observatory right who you know who probably rarely ever see women so they're all they're all you know freaking out about their partners and of oh, course man. because they're all beautiful women yeah well th that's the idea i think they more i think more attention was paid to that fact in this episode than any other is that all the dolls are dressed in a certain way and they're they're all very attractive because the the idea is I don't know. I guess it's just an attempt to glamorize the profession, to make it appealing, not just to like the the lower class, but also to, to people everyone. with money, so that they can get jobs like this. You know, keep themselves afloat. You got to figure that this paid pretty well. There were eighty of them, and they were there for five days. It was a week. I thought was it just five? Was days? It a week? Was it? Ah, eh, one of the two. Yeah, it was. It was a while. It was more than just a handful of days. But we know that Violet is master typist. Yeah, they get three days worth of work done on the first day. Um, probably because they don't goof around. Like At that point, Leon hasn't really fallen for her, so they're everybody else is probably like flirting up a storm. Violet's incapable of flirting. Leon doesn't is bad with women and or is cold to them, <laughs> depending and, on and who's trying she read. to outread her typing. Yeah, but she's way too fast. That the, scene was pretty funny. The, I did scene, like that. the scene where he asks her to go up with, to watch the comet on the observatory. Yeah, where he's holding like the he's baguette. He's holding the baguette and it's slowly disintegrating in his hands. What was that? Yeah, it was strange. I mean, the idea was, well, maybe maybe that gives some credence to um, your subs, you know, the Crunchyroll subs, because he says he's bad with women. And obviously he's bad with women based on that scene. He can't figure out how to ask, ask her out. It's Without strangling a baguette. Yeah. Um, Which is a capital punishment in France. In France, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I didn't like Leon very much. I didn't. Uh, the The way that his his problems with women were resolved by the appearance of a beautiful woman, like that, that is just lame. A beautiful woman who doesn't understand loneliness. Well, yeah, that that's right. That's he has to explain to her what you're feeling is loneliness. And so it's another instance of uh, Violet having to had like needing her own feelings to be explained to her. It's the story of a boy and his love for books and the girl who helps him realize that he can love again. This summer. Eh, I, I, I wasn't uh, I wasn't wild about this episode. I don't even have anything else to say about it. I don't think. How did it end? There wasn't another cliffhanger thing, was there? Nope, just the gondola. Right. He's like standing on the edge about to and fall he, off like into the abyss. Yeah. <laughs> they're above the clouds, aren't they? Yeah, they're really high up. Yeah. And he's uh he's like he like yells to her after the gondola has disappeared. I hope we'll see each other again someday. <laughs> yeah, just that reminds me just I was reminded just now when you said that of every episode of Pokemon. When it, it ends with like Ash, uh, Brock, and Misty leaving whatever town they've stumbled into. And he into. always screams backwards, we'll see you again soon while he's waving. Yeah. And, yeah. The, and the person who they're leaving behind says, I, you know, maybe we'll meet again or I hope we meet again. And it's always sunset and they're waving as they walk away. Is the narrator for Pokemon the same narrator for Space Dandy? It's a possibility. I think it is. I think he's just a lot older. Yeah, well, we'll get to Space Dandy in a bit. Let's uh, let's do let's do another show. And let's do you have any fi final words about final Evergarden thing? Uh, nothing else really to add. I think I covered the 
the things that I thought were juicy. <laughs> All right, let's do a different show. Let's do one that's already on the screen, uh, Kokoku. All right. How'd you feel about this one? Everybody hates Subasa. Or Takafumi. No, not, everybody hates Takafumi. Yes, everybody. Me. Everybody hates Takafumi. He's the he's the dad. Yeah. Apparently, he's he's like mentally unstable or insane, or maybe he's killed someone before. Uh, I I don't get the sense that he's killed somebody before. Just that he's that he's got some kind of mental problem, and he's. I, I don't know. I mean, for context, what we're talking about is the fact that even though uh, Majima wants to summon the the herald. And to try to rescue her family members. She can't muster the, the intent, intent to kill yeah. strong enough. For, but he does it. Without even trying, barely even trying. Just right. like, hey, what if I... Pfft, so he's, it is. he's got some sort of instability going, you know, up up in the old... The old nut, noodle. Nut house, the bird cage. I, I don't know what metaphor for brain I'm going for, but yeah, he's, he's a crazy person. Uh, the show is telling us, at least. Uh, so the cliffhanger from last time... Was that it looked like someone had gotten stabbed, but no, and that was never resolved even in this one. Well, it the the conflict between like the fight between Subasa and the blue polo shirt guy, right? That was resolved, but we didn't. I I didn't see that Subasa was stabbed or that he was because you see that you see the stab and you see blood, but there's he's got like a tear in his shirt, but there's no blood. There's nothing. Yeah. Like, I'm, this I'm this confused. shows cliffhangers are getting worse and worse. Although the one from this week was pretty good, uh, with Majima's brother having like exit. Yeah. the... I yeah. was expecting his eyes to open when he was just standing there with his eyes closed. I was expecting his eyes would open, and then that would be the cliffhanger. Show keeps botching his cliffhangers, man. They should have asked us. They should have. They should have asked they the average our, nerds. They should have found uh, our podcast on. The, the English version of YouTube. I'm sure there's like a YouTube.jp or .com.jp. Yeah, there, there's one for every country. So they should have found they should have found ours, which has less than like 300 views total across all of its videos. And uh, they should have, you know, gotten a translator to talk to us and ask us. And then they just reframe uh, the shot right before it goes to air. Or just redo the whole show. Yeah. <laughs> because obviously we know exactly what's best for the show even though it's halfway over. And even though uh, this is based on a manga, so they, they literally have storyboards done for them in in a book already. These cliffhangers, you gotta wonder, were they chapter endings, or are they like halfway through a page turn, and they're like, stop it there? Uh, I mean, they're, they're the types of cliffhangers that you you assume would be chapter endings, but they can do whatever they want. I mean, they can adapt it however they want. Right. And it's this is a new studio doing the show, Geno Studio. I think this is their first TV production, so there's no way. Oh, to really? Look at, yeah, uh, there's no way to look at their past shows and and judge how they've adapted things in the past. But this adaptation, this adaptation, whichever word you prefer, is is pretty okay. What did you think of this episode? Because remember, you weren't super hot on last week. I kind of like this one, although I was a little confused by the fact that um, her that Majima's family, their their bodies inside the heralds were still around i thought they had totally disintegrated at the end of the last one maybe because that happens every time the herald despawns no that that's not true remember the very first time we see the herald it doesn't disintegrate well it doesn't disintegrate but it does like little black particles yeah it, well i guess it kind of does disintegrate in a sense it like it um but dematerializes. Just, yeah, just a piece of it. But I, th I thought that in the last episode, Majim, the heralds with Majima's family members inside had... I thought they'd been destroyed. Yeah, I thought they had turned to sand. I thought so too. But apparently, their specters, like what the, the way that heralds form is, they've got the specters of people who had lost their will to live inside of them. And their bodies. Yeah, their bodies too. And they, like the heralds form around that. Because hmm. two of them... Like her, both her mother and her father were part of the same herald this time. Yeah, that was that was strange. The show is not really clearing up the concept of of heralds. Maybe if her if her brother is is able to talk somehow, be able to answer some questions. Yeah, or maybe we'll never know, and it's just this mystical force that exists. Yeah, I don't I don't know how okay with that I would be. I kind of want. Some answers. I want some answers, man. I, I need the twenty seventh episode of Ava. 
I don't want this to be like lost, you know, where you don't really know what's going on. It was all a dream. <laughs> I used to read Word Up magazine. Uh, I really, I really do hope that we we learn definitively how the heralds work, what they are, because the the show has gone into that uh, inquisitive mode once or twice with with the like the head of the Genuine Love Society licking his fingers and and taste. Oh, it tastes like protein. Right. And then there was the scene where um, Tsubasa, after Makoto had been kidnapped again, or he had run away, he loses his will to live. Right. And, and he starts to turn into a herald. Like, but then Jury expels his specter. And his body's fine underneath it. Yeah, it's fine it's like underneath. This, this sand just like forms around it. Because we also learn that it's basically sand. Or it has the consistency of sand. Yeah. I would say more that it has the consistency of sand. It seems that it grows out of them rather than it grows around them. I feel like it's a cocoon to protect the body. Yeah, because that's that's how heralds are. There's the body inside and then the, the herald around it is kind of a cocoon or I mean, it's more than a cocoon. It's more than just a, a place for, you know, stasis and nourishment. It's oh my god, dude! I just realized. Isn't when a when a when a larva forms a cocoon around itself before it becomes a butterfly or a caterpillar? Um, isn't that their time spent in the cocoon called stasis? And that's that's what they're in. I don't know if it's specifically called stasis because I'm not a Scientist. insectologist. <laughs> There's a specific word. For I don't. It. I, I don't, don't know what that is. word is either. I forget. Um, I, I kind of feel as though it's called stasis when a caterpillar is holed up in its cocoon before it becomes a butterfly. Interesting. I might be totally wrong about that. Maybe this revelation I'm having is just based on nothing. <laughs> it's possible. Anyway, yeah, there, there are still lots of, lots of things up in the air. Um, this episode doesn't cover much ground. I guess. I mean, that, that might be because Takafumi is back with his family. So the show doesn't have to keep cutting away to him. And in addition, uh, Majima kind of like joins the party in a sense. Even though the the way that she gets the the Yukawas to cooperate with her is by kidnapping the grandson. Right. Ma they uh, are Makoto. Yeah. They are still cooperating by the end. So the the show has kind of centralized itself. So that's probably why it feels like not a lot of stuff happens. I don't, I'm not saying not a lot of stuff happened. They don't cover much ground. Like it stays in the same location for 15 minutes ah i see what you're saying yeah um i was i kind of like this episode i thought it was pretty i thought the scene where jury was like where majima was trying to summon the the will to kill and she was like you know working up a sweat i thought that was somewhat um intense and then the scene where jury has to like you know do a whole bunch of like flips or, or <laughs> jump on top of the the handler and expel the specters from different parts of it i was i was kind of like you know i wasn't on the edge of my seat but i was maybe halfway there yeah because you also had the grandpa and the and the dad teleporting warping around all over the place trying to avoid the thing right yeah i uh i i like this episode you know more or less it wasn't one of my favorites i am realizing that i was most into the show at the start when everything was a big mystery and um not not as much now but I do still kind of like it for all the reasons that I've laid out in previous, you know, episodes of the podcast. I don't really feel like going back into it. Okay. What else is there to talk about? I, I want to make sure we don't miss anything because this show is so like so much of its appeal is based on learning, you know, figuring out what the genuine love society, the GLS is up to, what the heralds are, etc. We see them for three seconds this episode. Who, the GLS? Yeah. It's like, we lost them. Yeah, that's true. That's okay. They can teleport. That happens. <laughs> yeah. End of scene. Right. Um, I thought when um, Makoto kept saying, I want to go over there, I want to go over there, I thought he was going to teleport like to, to where he was trying to go. Yeah. Because depending on, you know, which lineage he's from, if he took the power from like his mom, let's say, would be able to have that ability. I thought that would have been like a what kind of moment. I so. guess if that's happening, the the show is saving that, you know, 
that card. We'll play it at a later date. I I do still think that he has some kind of power. But maybe I mean maybe he doesn't. That would be really disappointing. That's the problem with coming up with a theory in your head and <laughs> what and if really his dad is the head of the genuine love society? Um you mean Makoto's dad? Yeah. That's possible. It kind of makes sense. Because then he would he would be a descendant both of the the head family the Yukawas with the with the you know the boss stone the one that controls all the others and the people who are trying to steal it you know he's so is he is he is he good or is he bad are we are we born evil or are we a product of our environment it's yeah, a that's, question for brighter minds than ours it's a it's a question for the Japanese minds uh, making this show I guess. I suppose they might go that route. Yeah, it's possible that he's the that guy's son or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, it's also interesting to note that the the specters, the people inside the heralds, maintain some of their memories and their will because it's about to kill Majima, the, the specter stops. with her mom inside. Yeah, and it stops just for a brief moment before it it's expelled. You gotta wonder what happens to him on the other side when that's expelled does their dead body in a graveyard come back to life and then they Why would that happen? die from asphy asphyxiation well because they're pushed out of stasis yeah does that mean they unfreeze 17 years ago wait what explain that well they've been frozen for 17 years no they haven't the the mom and the dad yeah. oh they were they were put into stasis seventeen years ago. Okay, does that okay, mean I, seven, I was lost for a second? Does that mean time splits, and they're alive in an alternate timeline? I don't know, man. That's a little too much for me to comprehend. I feel as though I mean the simplest answer is probably that their their souls are pushed out into just nowhere, or the af afterlife. The afterlife. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Rather than their souls being trapped in limbo. Yeah, which is. Well, yeah, I guess. I don't know. We'll just have to wait and see. Wait and see. Two more shows to go from winter, anyway. Why don't you pick... Two from winter. Yeah, Franks and Brahmins. Oh, right. Uh, let's do Franks. Okay. <laughs> Man, a lot was riding on this episode because it's the big fight between the parasites and the claxosaurs. And... Now we're going to talk about what happened. Go okay. ahead. You do it. <laughs> you, I'm pushing this off on you. I guess I have to talk about this. Well, we had the big climax in the middle of the show. It was 24 minutes, no intro, no outro, no even pause in the middle. I mean, they had the credits at the end. There was just stuff going right, on behind them. Right, but there was stuff them. going on. I mean, they, they animated a full 24 minutes, not 20. Yeah. So I get what you're saying. I mean, anime often does that to signify that it's a big, important episode. Which this was. Which I guess. I mean, well, it was it was expensive at the least. Uh, dude, I I continue to be unimpressed by the show's visuals and its action. And that's probably not due to the animation, but more due to the color palette because it's a lot of brown, and a lot of black. I mean, even the robots that are pink, or. You know, um, I mean, I guess the the one that's pink that has um, the, the claws, little, the little midget guy inside, and his, you know, his waifu, yeah, with the the red hair. I'm I'm fixated on that robot and the fact that it's pink and that it doesn't stand out because it's the one that should. You know, if if any of them are going to make an impact visually, it would probably be that one just based on its color. But it 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 uh, I don't know it. Everything just so seems that a little washed out. That one to you stands out more than Strelitzia. Yeah, in terms of its coloring. I guess. I mean, if, if that's what you think, I can't say you're wrong. Maybe I was just thinking of the, the four non-Strelitzia um, I was I was flipping Bronx. through after I'd watched the episode because I was trying to remember a couple things. And it is, if you just go like piece by piece by piece it does look like they animated the whole show grabbed saturation and pulled it to 60 percent and just kind of desaturated the whole thing mm. the most vivid color is blue 
and it's just when one of the Klaxosaurus explodes. Right. I, I don't, yeah, I don't know why it looks that way, why they, why they choose that. Maybe it's the, the light that's being cast by, um, uh, I, I don't know, the domes, you know, the, what are those, what are those things called in this show again? Uh, I can't remember, dude. They're called like plantations yes, or something. Yes, plantation. Maybe the, the light that's, maybe they're being bathed in like soft light from the plantations. Or maybe the idea is that um, you know there's there's no sea, so there's no the sun isn't reflecting on on anything. I it was also nighttime. That's that's true. It was, it was midnight. I, yeah, but it, it, the show always looks a little a little washed out when it's when there are mech fights happening. Right. I suppose that is due to the whole world just being brown. Maybe it's a strategy, like an animation strategy. Maybe the more saturated something is, the more you you notice uh, movement, and so pulling pulling back on the saturation, making compensates things, for a lack of movement. Using using like lighter colors, yeah, compensates. I I thought the the fights were impressive, like they were extremely well animated and really smooth and just looked super cool. I I on, honestly I think it's just because I'm not into this show that I don't really like the visuals. That's my guess. I also like f fighting robots. So yeah, I, as you've I, said many times before. I am a connoisseur. Oh, okay. So <laughs> speaking of the fights, uh, we have Squad Twenty Six, the the bunch of no names with the same looking robot. Right. They. What was the deal with their strategy of taking things one little baby Klaxosaur at a time and and devoting all five of their Frank's robot things? You'd, like they would all surround it and tie it up with their their and orange one of them spears. Would stab through it. Yeah, that took so long. And in the meantime, they were letting a bunch of Klaxosaurus go by them and towards the unequipped noobs, right? Who are Plantation Thirteen. I right. thought that was silly <laughs> the way they approached combat. It was all like a setup for Strelitzia saving the day. It was also supposed to be like, you know, they're they're super coordinated they're all about like unit cohesion you know there are no rogue pilots or there are no rouge pilots yeah um, it, it, i mean it, it definitely does illustrate the fact that they're all about teamwork but i was i was bothered by it how in, inefficient it was they're supposed i mean it's true that they are they are all like one unit hashtag one unit and they <laughs> and they uh they are all about teamwork and the, the, the members of Plantation 13, all those kids, all those parasites, they're always butting heads and stuff. So there is a contrast to be had there. You know, e um, what's her face? Zero Two even says their teamwork is a mess. They're all going to get wiped out. Right. Know? Because it is. I, un I understand that it, it illustrates that, to have them, you know, working in harmony. The 26 guys. I think it also... But aren't they also supposed to be, like, really experienced? Like, aren't they supposed to be experts? I think it minimizes risk as well. No, it doesn't, because while you're all focusing on one of the little baby Klaxosaurs out of the hundreds that were depicted at the start of the episode, yeah, then you're you're just going to get ambushed while you're all focusing on one little harmless, I don't know. And then eventually bucket. Strelizia flies in and just RKO's like 50 in one hit. Yeah. <laughs> or not 50, but a lot. It's pretty dumb. I don't know. I thought it was cool. Yeah, I it was uh it was the big it was it seems like this episode was the end of an arc because just like the show started with his whole metaphor about the bird sharing its wings it ends with the same speech. Right, but rather than using imagery, it just comes out and says a man needs to I lean on a woman. I want to be your wings. Yeah. Oh, does it say that? I don't yeah. remember that. A man needs to lean on a woman, something like, or 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 a woman needs to lean on a man, or something, because they're leaning on each other when they walk out. Okay. Yeah, I remember that scene. I guess I was looking more at the picture than the words. Also, do you see the, the the Ava wings I there did. at the end? Yeah. And the 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 on the verge of death sort of like, you know, pseudo mind meld when the when the uh, the angels are trying to talk to uh Shinji and he's going through the same like experience and he's in a You're talking about when Hero thinks that he's died? Yeah. Okay, that the, was the worst part of the episode. He's in a forest and then he's talking to that girl who died at the start who was his his partner, partner. Naomi, I think was her name. Right. Maybe. Yeah, that was the worst part of the episode for me. Did anyone watching the show out of the I don't know, millions of people, let's say, watching this show? 
between all the otaku in Japan and all the weebs in America, between like and and ever and everywhere else, because anime is a global thing. Out of all the millions of people who watched this episode, did anyone think for a fraction of a second that he was actually dead? Let's start with you. Did you think that he was dead? No, I didn't think he was dead. <laughs> but I thought it, I thought it would have been interesting if he. I thought it would have been almost good if he had died. I was thinking that he was going to like turn into a Klaxosaur or something because he had that he had you know dinosaur AIDS or he was like going to turn blue or something. Yeah, like power up, do do something other than uh, saving the day with your resolve to protect this girl who entered your life. Uh, you know, a couple weeks ago, and now and the you only love reason her. you like her is because tits. No, the reason he likes her is because she calls him darling, and like you know, the 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 I idea guess. is that he's able to pilot, and he's able to he's worth something now, and this is his purpose. Brainwashing is a powerful tool, man. Yeah, I think this show is probably brainwashing all the Japanese people watching it into buying minifigs. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Or just, I, I don't know. Who, who knows what the message is at this point. And then we had, um, right at the end of the episode, a new player has entered the battlefield. Yeah, um, so he, he said something about, I wrote it down. You probably did too. What uh, does he say? Yeah, he calls somebody Nine Iota. Yeah. What, who do you think he was talking to? Zero Two? Well, he referred to both of them at the same time. He was probably talking about Zero Two, though. When you wait, when you say that he was referring to both of them at the same time, what do you mean? I mean the way he phrased what he said. He could have been talking to either one of them. Oh yeah, but he wasn't talking to. He was directing his comment at one person in particular. Pro probably Zero Two. It's probably Zero Two. Yeah. So my theory is that Zero Two used to be a human. That she was a part of their squad because it wasn't just the blonde boy. It was there were three of them. You could see three figures when. When it was still a, you know, like a... A wide shot, yeah. Yeah, when it was farther away. Um, so I think that she used to be a part of their... In fact, I'll go I'll go so far as to say that Zero Two used to be his partner when she was still a human. And uh, she was injected with Klaxosaur blood as a, you know, by, let's say, Dr. Franks, who showed up again in this episode. Uh, maybe at the behest of those, those white-robed robots guys in the, in the council who we see the every council once in a while. The council of nine. Is that what they're called? I think, and if not, that mine you sounds made that cooler up. anyways. I I think that she was injected with Klaxosaur blood on purpose to become a weapon to fight the Klaxosaurs. And her purpose is to kill more Klaxosaurs. Right. Which she says at the end of the, the episode, I need to kill right. more Klaxosaurs. Yeah. I, I also thought it was strange that like she's she's his she's his darling and he obviously like you know is is really into her as well they come they come out of the robot everybody's celebrating and she just stands off in a corner he doesn't even bring her over to, to everyone else she's just kind of chilling doing her thing and he's getting like congratulated by everybody else well he he's a dick wait what why is that like that's a that's an awkward social situation he knows that everybody else doesn't really approve of her so what is he supposed to do? I ignore the fact that everyone's really happy in the aftermath of this battle and go over and like force Zero Two into the conversation and force everyone else to to be like to kill them to kill the mood? It, that doesn't make any sense. You know how like when you're at a party or something and you've maybe you've you've brought somebody yeah. with you and it's and it's kind of hard to introduce that person sometimes in the middle of a conversation. You can't find the right moment. Think of think of that that difficulty multiplied by a million. That's how hard it would have been for him at, in the aftermath of this battle to be like, be like, hey guys, Zero Two really helped out. She did like a lot of really good work and here she is. Now she's in the middle of this shot and she's in the middle of all of you. Everybody talk to her. That doesn't make any sense. I don't know. I just, I thought it, I thought it was weird. I see. I did, that didn't really occur to me. Um, it makes sense that she would be off to the side. She's a, she's a loner and she views everybody else as weak. She probably didn't want to go over there and talk to everybody because she only cares about her darling. And she doesn't really... I honestly don't even think that she really cares about him. She seems to view him as like a power source. That's the the feel that I'm getting. So the whole show is just 
symbolism for women overthrowing the patriarchy. <laughs> Dude, I, I is don't, that what this is? All the all the sexual metaphors and all its symbolism, it's all very confused. I don't mean that I am confused by it. I mean that the show itself is like very conflicted. <laughs> It's just throwing everything at the wall and seeing what sticks. For me, none of it is stuck. The This episode, I get that it was like a big, important battle and that it was the end of an arc, etc. But what really like put the final nail in this show's coffin, for me personally, was Hero's quote-unquote death scene. I thought it was awful. The whole time, my brain was screaming, he's not dead, he's not dead, there's no way that he's dead, he's a main character. He's just going to come out of this and they're going to power up. Like that that big uh, Klaxosaur was sledgehammering them. Like with, it was a giant piston and it was like, boom, boom. They were somehow still alive after probably hundreds of, hundreds of those hits. Uh, slowly dying. Slowly. But there was never a question that he would survive. If and when he dies, it'll be because of, uh, you know, piloting the robot or completely uh, uh, wow I, I lost I lost the word he's he's likely to turn into uh, a klaxosaur or you know honestly I kind of want him to grow horns or something weird yeah I mean a, a lot of people are, are thinking that he will I think that he way he will. can be weird too they can be weird together and make everyone else uncomfortable I'm already uncomfortable man Whenever uh, I have da, to... da, 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 this whole conversation <laughs> bothers me. Thanks, Howard. I don't. Uh, I'm not. I'm. I'm voting that we drop this. You really want to? Yeah, that's my. That's my feeling. I mean, you would obviously have to agree. I mean, we can drop it if you want, but I'm going to keep watching it. Yeah, I don't. I don't want to watch anymore. It's reached the end of an arc that I didn't care about. I don't see that as a as a reason to continue watching to see if it gets better. I've given it six episodes. So I mean, you you uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. I'll continue reporting. Yeah, we'll we'll talk about that later. Okay. So let's do the last one, unless there's anything else you had. No. Oh, let's let it be over. Please. Let it be. Let's do ramens. Okay. Let me scroll to your notes about it. Did you? Yeah. You must have watched it first. I know this is your favorite. It is my favorite. This episode was fucking insane. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not in a good way. No, you know what? I I like I kind of like this episode because it was like balls to the wall, a plot development every thirty seconds. It didn't make a ton of sense, but it circled around. Like it was so crazy that it circled around to being good. <laughs> I really like this episode too. It was nuts. I don't even want to try to summarize everything that went on. Honestly, it would just be a chore. There was a lot. Just people, you know, double crossing each other and people sword fighting and new assassin. The there was a new assassin introduced. I guess we can talk about her. What was her name? Um, it was. I did not write. write did I have not it. Write it down. Give me, give me one second, everybody. Sayuri, Sayuri San, and we're pretty sure she's Bamba's ex. I saw that you had written that down. Why? Why do you say that? Uh, the way they looked at each other, the way they looked at each other, and it's like, is that no? There's no way it can be. Is she? Is he? Is she Bonba's blank? No, no. Oh, you're talking about mushroom. Are you talking about the line of dialogue from Mushroom Head at the very end in the baseball game, where he says, "Is that Bonba's dot dot dot?" Yeah, he's saying that he's he's not looking at Sayuri when he says that. He's looking at um the the ninja hitman, Saruchi. The submarine ninja. Yeah. I could have sworn that that's what I got. I don't... Maybe I got it from something completely wrong, but... No, maybe I got it wrong, honestly, because I didn't understand why he would... Like, how he would recognize the silver hair guy and and why he would know that he and Banba had met each other in the past. So maybe he wa maybe I misinterpreted that scene and he was talking about Sayuri. Uh We know that they're linked in some way because... She doesn't she hire the Niwaka samurai? No, the Niwaka samurai or Banba hires her to kill the head of the the Kaku Association. Was it Banba? Okay, this this one I'm sure about. It was definitely Banba. Oh, so so you know that Sayuri is. Um, it said who would who could possibly? 
It's like, who would be crazy enough to hire someone to create to... And she says, an insane man. Right. And then she later refers to Bamba during the baseball game as an insane as an insane man. Okay. So it's definitely him. Um, the, the first time she calls him that is he's not even in the scene. She's talking to her handler, which, who's the same guy who's trying to really blow up the submarine ninja. Um, it's the silver-haired guy with the glasses. He's like, he's kind of like um, the old man who runs the ramen stand in that he's a he's a fence for, yeah. for hitmen. He's like a talent agency. Yeah, pretty much. Um, he's a manager. So he, he's I'm going to take you to the top, baby. He's a, he's a manager who wants to take the submarine ninja to the top. He also runs um, Sayuri's, all of her jobs go through him. Mm-hmm. Because he asks, he's the one who asks her, why did someone want to kill the head of the Kaku Association? Which she did. And she said, I don't know, it must have been an, an, it would take an insane person to make that request. So it's definitely Banba who, who, you know, ask for that job to be done right in order to protect lynn we can only assume yeah i guess so he definitely does seem to be really like obsessed with lynn almost at this point telling you there's something there i wonder if lynn is more significant than just somebody who he like you know bumped into on the street and and struck up a friendship with don't know i don't know either it's hard to know what to think when you're when you're talking about this show or when you're watching it (laughs) Or when you're just contemplating its existence. What did you uh, think of the sword fights? I actually thought that the the second sword fight between the Niwaka Samurai and the Submarine Ninja, um, when they're on the rooftop, I thought that was more impressive than anything that happened in Darling of the Franks. Really? Yeah, and it wasn't even that, you know, technical or impressive. Oh man, my stomach is rumbling. You just thought. I it wonder could... if the microphone picked that up. Probably not. I mean, I could boost it so that it will. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> okay, it's too much work. Uh, yeah, I thought the I thought the sword fight, the, particularly the second one, um, after they've gone on the run from the the Kaku organization, like the the second in command guy, right? Whatever his role is, I think that's who he's supposed to be. They have the sword fight afterwards. Maybe. Yeah, I thought it would look pretty good. I thought so too. Good enough. Um, oh boy. Yeah, it, I mean, it's hard to know what to talk about next because it, it would be a, like a futile endeavor to to try to summarize the entire thing or to recap it. Sayuri, she she seems important. But there was one other development I think that was worth mentioning. Or maybe not. <laughs> Looking over here at my notes and uh Yeah, I'm trying to look as well. I wonder I wonder if um I mean the it ends with the baseball game. Yeah. And both the submarine ninja and Sayuri and their their manager, they're on a different team. A different ramen team. Oh, did their uniform also say ramen? If the scoreboard. Yeah. Oh, they're okay. they're all like ramen stands apparently, or they're all sponsored by ramen stands. Yeah, <laughs> that's <laughs> okay. Um, I forget what I was gonna say about the baseball game. Oh, that they're all on a different team. I wonder if they're. I mean, Bonba has contracted her for a job at this point, and maybe if you're if you're right and you're reading of the, the final scene, maybe she and him they already have some kind of connection, and at this point. Banba and um, the Saruchi, you know, the silver-haired ninja guy, they've discovered each other's identities because they they punch each other's hats off <laughs> at the in the very end. Right. He's, he's storming I, the mound. I wonder if they're going to team up. You know, I wonder if they're going to be brought into the fold as good guys or main characters or whatever term you prefer. I don't know. Me neither. Because <laughs> they hashed out their, their rivalry to a certain extent. Don't well, you think that the silver hair guy still wants to kill him? Because that that was that was his motivation in this episode. I think so, but like, I think he, he didn't care about the money. He wanted to fight the. I think he Samurai. realizes now that it would be way more difficult than he thought it was going to be. Yeah, because the guy's good with the sword. Yeah, he does seem to lose the fight. Yeah, but Bonba pulls him back up. Because he doesn't want the parade doesn't, to get doesn't disrupted. He doesn't want them to disrupt the yeah, parade. He's, yeah, he's a, he's a goofy character. 
He doesn't. He's uh, a he's got both that spicy a, Pollock row. Yeah, he's more interested in the the parade that he was going to be a part of the the festival or the ceremony, and he then he, finishing off someone who wants to kill him. Yeah, he's a PI and an assassin, but he that just seems to be a way of paying the bills for him, I guess. I, and that's kind of fitting given the sort of city that they live in. I'm a I'm about tapped out for this one. TBH. Yeah, without going over like all the plot details, there's you know because there's way too many to cover. Yeah, I agree. So you think that Sayuri is Bamba's ex, huh? Yep. Gonna have to go back and check that out, man. I'm pretty sure. All right. Well, that that just now that this one's done, that just leaves us with the final two episodes of Space Dandy. Episode twenty five. Which doesn't matter. What do you mean it doesn't matter? Oh, you, so I guess you didn't like it if you're saying that it doesn't no, matter. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying I didn't like it. I'm saying it literally doesn't matter. <laughs> I didn't write anything about it. I said literally this whole episode was pointless. It wasn't pointless. It's, you know, it, do you think that any of the other episodes are pointless? They're all, they all stand pretty much by themselves. I mean, it was pointless because Dandy's asleep the whole time. <laughs> Well, that's the thing. The The nature of the show, the way it was constructed with a bunch of people being brought in to like write, direct their own episodes, they're just borrowing the characters that Watanabe has conceived. So obviously somebody wanted to tell a story about a murder and a, and a trial in a courtroom with a bunch of alien lawyers and metaf uh, some metaphysical twist. And he just, you know, you, you got to put Dandy in there, so let's put him on trial. I thought... Um... I thought the episode was a vessel for explaining Pionium. Yeah, it pretty much was that. So in that sense, it's not pointless. No, but I just... <laughs> the fact that you could exclude that entire episode and nobody would... not Well, you could do that with a lot of dandy episodes. Yeah, they all stand by themselves. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. And at the very end of this episode, all the Gogol Empire henchmen are waiting for him outside the, the courthouse. Which we also see at the start of the next episode. Yeah, but... Animated in a different style, even. Oh, I, I didn't realize it. It was, was back to its classic dandy, quote-unquote. Hmm. Okay. Um, I mean, you I, the episode wasn't pointless because it, it led into that, I guess. I guess. But taking the story, you know, on its own, I, uh... I thought I, I thought it was okay. I don't like I didn't like the the idea that that kid was actually the the real killer. I mean, I know that the the whole idea is that the baseball his his feelings were so intense that it caused the baseball to warp space warp in space and time, teleport to where Dandy was, and then hit the guy in the side of the head. Yeah, and knock him unconscious. And since he's a rare alien, nobody knows how to diagnose him. He's not actually dead. He is just unconscious. So the whole the whole trial in that sense was pointless. One of the one we of the aliens that even he is says, like a super that he's like a masked. He was a, a an old famous like pro wrestler. Yeah, but he for some reason he was like blackballed. So his his wife bought him a bunch of like a, a mask and brass knuckles and a, a bunch of other stuff so he could rejoin the, the wrestling world. So that, you know, cast doubt on her because she's buying weapons. Right. And, and people the think they wanna, the life yeah. insurance policy was 50 times what the the uh, registration fee was. It's a bit convoluted the whole the whole plot. But the the thing it it all, you know, it tied itself together in the end. The thing that I didn't like was that the kid was the murderer because I don't I didn't really like the performance that his voice actor gave when he when he was, you know, like beating up his friend at the end, because that was the reason he got so mad that he could kill somebody and plotted to with the bat where he made the cracks in it so that the, right. the, the so bat that would the kill him. The shards would fly into him and kill him. Yeah. The whole reason that he was that mad was because his friend blocked him on Twitter. And when he was expressing that at the end, as they were, you know, like struggling and fighting, um, he didn't he didn't sound like he was full of rage. He just sounded mildly annoyed. Yeah, and that's I guess typical of almost all Jap of almost all dubs is just there is this insane intense emotion in Japanese yeah. dubs that just doesn't exist in American ones. Yeah, uh, I, th but that, I think that also comes from the fact that Japanese dubs and we expect the American dub to sound like it, but in English essentially, 
and they're the way they act they voice act is over the top and stylized people don't talk like, talk like that in real life yeah well the, there are anime where you don't get voice acting like that but they it's, go for realism. those are atypical though yeah that's true yeah i mean i i totally agree with what you're saying I mean, that that's the reason why we get performances like this one where what's happening on screen does not match the intensity or lack thereof in the, the English actor's performance. May also have to but do it, with it union just, rules? I don't know. <laughs> what? There are really, like, there are strict union rules on, like, how long, like, vocally stressful sessions can last. Really? Uh-huh. Yeah. I guess I, I, don't know. I guess that makes sense. Yeah, there, there was, was a huge strike, a huge sag after a strike recently. For the video game industry, that lasted 11 months. So you mean no dialogue was recorded for video games in America for 11 months? By union workers, yeah. Every game company had to use non-union workers, oh, I which see. means they used people who weren't the best. And some people that made uh, sequels to games switched voice actors in the oh, middle. interesting. So like AAA franchises were probably impacted because you got to figure they were wanting, they got the biggest talent in the first place and a lot of the people who are well, maybe the biggest talents wouldn't be part of the union. They would just want to go for as much money as possible and like leave everybody else out of it. I don't know. That's a, that's kind of off topic. <laughs> Only a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So you didn't like the fact that the uh, the kid was the killer. Well, I I didn't like the fact that he was like so mad about being blocked on Twitter, and I thought I, that I was hilarious. I really I did really like the the animation in the scene where he. The, yeah, like the pit, that was the really the cool. Yeah, I didn't. Uh, I didn't care for him though. the uh, The idea that Danny was asleep, I was fine with that. I mean, you you can brush off the episode as being kind of inconsequential, um, but it it is interesting that the the witness who is brought up to the stand to talk about Pionium is the advisor to Johnny, the head of the Jaikar Empire. Yeah, who shows up in episode twenty six. Yes, he does. Uh, so I guess. Now is as good and a time as any to segue into that one. Is that episode, episode 26, the end, baby. Yeah. Dandy is offered the opportunity to, to become God. And turns it God. down. Yeah. Turns out the narrator is God. Well, he, he kind of says, oh, you can call me God if that's what you want. But really, I'm just uh, the narrator. Yeah, I'm just the narrator. But I'm also, a, what? How, in what way was he God? I can't remember. He, he existed everywhere at all times and you yeah. can see everything and dandy was the only other being like that right and so i i thought that dandy rejecting godhood uh i thought that the show had already done something like that previously um in the limbo episode yeah where, where he, he's like i just want to be me yeah i don't i don't want to pass on and become um, you know, immortal and have no worries and never be uh, hungry or, or tired. I'd, I'm going to boobies instead. You know, and he says the same thing in this episode. Yep. If, if I'm a god and I don't have a body, I can't. I can't go to boobies. I thought the the limbo episode did that a little better, but I don't begrudge the show. You know, I, for I doing the same thing twice. If they had, if he had accepted the next season. Or if it had played the clip of the start of the first episode with him narrating, oh, that would and been someone else playing Dandy, that would have been uh, that, that would have been, been a way to go. Yeah, but then that rules out the possibility of sequel because the very last thing you see is uh, maybe continued. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, but there's a ton of other stuff that happened in this episode. Sure, there was a there were a lot of. Um, spaceship fights. War breaks out between the Gogol and Jaikro empires. Yeah, the not for the not for the first time, right? right. But this is like the final conflict. The, right. the it's the one that resets the universe, kind of. The Jaikro go to uh, the Gogol empire's base, essentially. Yeah, where they have that big super weapon that's that needs to be powered by Pionium, which almost looks like a lance of Longinus. <laughs> There like, was a distinct the, the Ava reference in yeah, this episode. Yeah, the Tree of Life. Yeah. The Dandy's on. Did you, you remember how there were uh, nine um, artificial Evangelions that Seal had made? Yeah. There were nine circles on the Tree of Life that Dandy was chained well, there, to. There were nine circles on the actual Tree of Life yeah. as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was... Wait, what do you mean the actual Tree of Life? Like, 
the tree of life that's not something that's in just one anime it's all yeah, over the place I it's know. from something but yeah was it was it like uh an idea of da vinci's or something did it come from one of his notebooks probably the idea of like you know the the person like this with the the tree coming down from them that's my that's my best guess it probably it probably was i'm sure we can look it up that's too hard yeah we have supercomputers in our pockets it's too hard to look stuff up yep yeah, so there there was that Ava reference, and uh, I I kind of got the idea that it looked like the Lance of Longinus, their big super weapon. But I mean, I'm sure that you could pull up hundreds of similar looking super weapons from science fiction. It's probably borrowing from a lot of stuff. It needs pionium energy to function. Dandium's uh, dandy dandy is <laughs> oh my god, dandy is made of pionium energy. Yeah, I, I, we even learn in episode 25 that he doesn't have any DNA. What is that about? He's just made of energy. He's just made of pionium energy. Yeah. I wonder how he got to be that way. I wonder if Dandy is is actually God. Or if Dandy is the narrator. Well, he's not he's not the narrator. The narrator is his own being. And the narrator was the chameleonian. Did you catch that? Yeah. <laughs> that was, I thought that was I pretty clever. I appeared to you once briefly. I I mean Dandy is kind of like he's already a godlike being. But he doesn't. He doesn't really understand or realize it. No, he's not fully conscious of it. The universe seems to reset at the end of this episode because um, it's him and QT and the Hello uh, Oi having the exact same conversation from the first episode. And uh, Meow's not even there yet. It's all about the legs, baby. Yeah. But it. Do you remember? It says fourteen point eight billion years later. Yeah, which is exactly how long they he, the narrator says that he's been around. Right. So, so how exactly did did that work? Um, it's not. It, was it fourteen point eight billion years after his conversation with Dandy that he ends up back where he started? I guess. I mean, fourteen point eight billion is pretty rough because that leaves a gap of. 500 mil 500,000 years in either direction if you round what 14.8 billion is not a precise number there's a lot yeah. of zeros after it yeah so it just means roughly the same amount of time that had already passed i guess why did it take that long for the universe to reset well because essentially the universe collapsed into nothingness and then it's, oh, it's, I see. Yeah. So the universe, re like the universe, literally reset, and it it took as long as it did for the universe to reach that point where Dandy was. Yeah, it's, talking to QT. It's also it had to do everything over again. Yeah, it's also what's sometimes known as the uh, the closed uh, the closed universe closed circuit the, closed universe theory, right. which is where everything expands. It stops at some point. There's a gravitational center to the universe. It all comes back together. And then re explodes and starts over. Right. That's one theory. Yeah. So I, I guess that's what happened. That explains it. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. He, so he turns down, you know, the offer to be God. And because he just wants to be, he just wants to be me, baby. He just wants boobies, baby. <laughs> it was a, it was a fun show. I really liked how um, Scarlet and Honey joined uh, QT and Meow on the Aloha Oi trying to, Save Dandy. Yeah. I thought it was interesting that B was a spy for the Jai Crow Empire all along. Yes. <laughs> and then he betrays them in order to try to control the world. Yeah. When you control the mail, you <laughs> control information. He was the Newman of the show. Yeah. It was, uh, I, I really enjoyed watching it again. I really enjoyed watching it dubbed. I, it's one of the only dubs I've seen. But uh, also, you know, one of the better ones, I guess. I I, uh, I especially like how they explain in episode twenty five that pionium is uh, or can be activated by like intense uh, emotions. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Dandy's pionium is activated by Honey's underwear. Oh, is is that? Was yeah, that he's, he's I, see, I mean, I know he's that seeing he, a screen of them back on Earth, and she pulls down her pants and shows her shows him like his underwear, and then like his eyes get massive, and yeah. he, like all his clothes rip off, and he <laughs> flies forwards. Oh yeah, that that makes sense. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, that he, his intense love for the booty 
is yeah. what allowed him to save the universe. Yeah. That's that's clever, I guess. <laughs> well, it's in in classic dandy fashion, it's kind of clever on one hand and then like really Crass. stupid. Yeah, on the other. Yeah. It 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 did uh, allow him to power up. I didn't make the connection that it was actually pionium energy that was being activated there. Yeah, the latent energy inside Dandy. <laughs> <laughs> I really love that sequence at the end. Like a lot, a lot of the a uh, lot of the space fights and the like, you know, the sailing of the Aloha Oi through this through space and up to the um, the Gogol base. A lot of that uh, wasn't wasn't the smoothest, you know. There was there was a there were a lot of explosions that they had to animate, and just a lot of a lot of fighting, a lot of motion. Trigger worked on the episode as well as Bones. Did they? Mm-hmm. During the credits. Uh, yeah, you have to imagine that part of it was you know shared between studios or outsourced, because there was a lot of a lot of work to be done there. The scene where um the small dan uh, the robot dandy is surfing on the Aloha Oi through like those cracks underground throughout the planet is was super cool. Yeah, I, it was cool, but at the same time, um, a after a while, you start to if you like focus too intently on what's going on, you just realize it's just a bunch of shapes on screen. Like when it's going through those green pipes, it's just a it's just a bunch of shapes. <laughs> That are, I mean, all all drawings are just a series of shapes in a in an organized fashion, but you really you really want not to think about that. You, you know, you want to be totally immersed. And a, a a lot of the the earlier, like big explosions and uh, mech fights and you know space battles, a lot of that I was I was uh, criticizing it as you know as a bunch of drawings. But when it got to that part at the end where you know, he sees the booty and he and he powers up. That was all just like liquid cool, man. It was just like it's like liquid fresh. It was like the, when he was surfing. It was just so. It was just. Mwah, it was just so beautiful. It looked so good. Yeah. It was awesome. Yeah, that I, I think I typed like a, just a couple sentences during the start of that episode, and then I just I, I stopped. I just watched. Yeah. Why not? Oh, we also saw um, Admiral Perry's final form. Yeah, he's a, just a person. Yeah, he was. I'm I'm guessing that he was based on Commodore Perry, who was the American naval officer who first went to Japan in the I don't know when I forget seven eight. It wouldn't be the 1700s. America was. It hadn't even been established as a world power at that point. I don't remember when it was. One of the first times that America went to Japan was uh, the very, very early 1900s to try to get them to open their ports to yeah, trade. Yeah, that was Commodore Perry who led that um, that expedition or that mission. Um, so I'm guess. I mean, I even went to the Wikipedia page for Admiral Perry to see what he looked like, or for Commodore Perry to see what he looked like. Uh, it didn't look like him, but I mean, his name was Admiral Perry, and the Google Empire was really. Um, imperialist like they wanted to conquer and that's probably the the idea that japanese people have about the real life commodore perry was that when america came to japan and said you need to open trade with us they were japan probably thinks that he was like america was just being a, a giant dick yeah as a as a nation because we were you know trying to mine japan for our own our own gain but that's how that's how all countries interact they're all trying to get the better of each other of course, you know, economically. Anyways, Space Dandy's a good show, and I enjoyed watching it. Yeah, I, I really liked uh, the finale, and I thought episode twenty-five was interesting. I do <laughs> like uh, court cases and stuff like that. Like I've seen way too much Law and Order. Thanks, Dad. Um, chung chung. And one of my favorite movies is Twelve Angry Men. That is a good film. I actually watched it recently. I was in a a college class about. It's called Law and Justice. And of course, we watched 12 Angry Men. I it's mean, a the, good movie, especially the, for 59. Good movies were being made back then. You don't have to say especially. No, I mean... It's, it's, yeah, that's a good point. It's reverse racist. That's reverse <laughs> ageist. <laughs> <laughs> that's decadist. All right, now that we've seen every episode of Space Dandy, we'd like to present to you each of our top five um, episode lists so, brace yourselves. Brace yourselves for, for some, the normetry. 
Oh, on my part. why do you say that? You picked on, all the I'm, like the coolest ones. Yeah, I'm probably going to be uh, Captain Norm. Okay. Do we gonna do we wanna go five to one? Yeah, five to one. And we'll just both say our five, you know, the same way we always do. What okay. was your number five pick? Uh the episode uh with Dandy and Scarlet on a date. Okay. I like um, that episode. Me too. I for number five, I put Meow's Home Planet. The okay. ground the Groundhog Day. One. Yeah, I love that episode too. Yeah. Did you put it in your top five? Uh no, I didn't actually. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, I I uh it's good to hear that you love the episode and it didn't even crack your top five. I don't know if that's because you forgot about it and forgot to include it or because no, you just I, like No, I consciously episodes. thought about it. Yeah, I like that one. There are just so many good episodes. All right, I'll say my number four. Um, it's the one where Dandy and Scarlet go on a bunch of dates. Okay, mine was the episode where they're zombies. Okay, that was my number three. <laughs> okay. Uh, my number three was the High School Musical parody. Okay, that d- actually did not make it onto my top five. Um, I can understand, but that. I I do like that episode. I'm sure it would be in the top ten. Yeah. So you like the High School Musical one? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I put Limbo for number two, and I'm pretty sure that won't appear on your list. Uh, number two was the Rock Band. Okay, that was my number one. Yeah, my number one was the Space Race. Yes, the race in space is Dandy Baby. Or As we learn like in a parallel universe, Dandy was a professional space racer. Yeah, uh, which is when why the narrator ha- is naming all his past. Which is why he has all these latent abilities that he never knew he had. It's because in other versions of himself, he does them in other, in other professionally. Yeah. yeah. He, that's why he's a surfer. Yeah, that's why he's a surfer. That's why he's a good truck driver for that one episode. That's why he has all of these random capabilities. Right. So we did we share three of the same episodes? I think we did. No, uh, no, it was no, two. It was just, yeah, I guess no, two. It, was, it was three. Rock Band, uh, Zombie, and The Date, the Scarlet episode. Yeah. Three, three of, of our, them. That's pretty, you know, that's pretty remarkable. Uh, I, maybe remarkable is the wrong word, but it's unlikely, you know, so that I think that speaks to how good those episodes were, like how fun, how funny yeah. they were. Uh, it's a good show. Good show. Quite good, quite good. Quite good, quite good. All right. Uh, well, I guess we'll just jump straight from one ranking session to another because we we normally you know rank all the winter series. And now I guess it's time to do that as well. Yeah. Why not? Uh, number five. I had Evergarden. Uh, I put Frank's. Okay. I know you, you. You hate this show. You hate yourself. You want to die. <laughs> I get it. I sure do, man. Although that doesn't have anything to do with Darling and the Franks. <laughs> um, I put Evergarden fourth. So. I put Kokoku fourth. Yeah, we clearly didn't like um, Violet Evergarden that much this week. Like, even combined. Yeah. I put Soriori third. I put Soriori third as well. Okay. That's a big change from last week where we ranked it one, two. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, I didn't think the episode was as strong this time. Kokoku was my second place pick. Franks was second for me. And I put Ramen's first. Ramen's was my first as well. <laughs> I put it last, last week. Yep, you did. Um, I, I just thought it was so, um, you know, nuts. This episode was just crazy. And I, I don't think I would like the show very much if every episode were like this. But this one was... I don't know. I just admire how how much stuff they managed to pack into it while while remaining uh, somewhat coherent. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, it was pretty darn coherent. Although we, I will want to go back and see what Mushroom Head was talking about when he was like, was he talking about uh, the submarine ninja or or Sayuri the right Sayuri, the new assassin, the new kid on the block. Yeah, I'm I'm getting ready to. I I want to dump Darling in the Franks, but. You're still, you know, you're still watching and enjoying it, so we'll we'll figure out what we want to do there. Okay. Before the next episode, and we're since Space Dandy is done, we're going to be replacing it with another another Bone series, another Bone series, and I was going to say classic, but I think it, yeah. it's better just to say uh, at this point, you know, a uh, an older series. Well, it's only it's a, not even that old. It it's was only from 2014, wasn't it? 2015, I think. 15. Okay. It's Mob Psycho 100. That's yeah. the show we're talking about. Yeah, and it's I would it's not fair to say that it's a classic. I've seen the first two episodes, but I don't remember seeing either of them. You were because you were really drunk, I right? Was blackout drunk. Yep. Cool. <laughs> I watched him with my roommate. He might remember, but I don't. All right. Looks like we're gonna get it done before a minute and thirty seconds, which is 
<laughs> uh, an hour and 30 minutes. We got about 30 seconds left. Would you like to sign us out? Sign us off? Sign us away from here? <laughs> Get me away from the word soup that is my brain. This has been episode 18 of always needing improvised medium explosions. Bye. <laughs>